M-theory attempts to create a system that resolves the discrepancies between gravity and the quantum world, needing a sort of new language or creating a new mixture if we were to quote Negrastani to do so, replacing point particles with strings. M-theory fits in with toy philosophy's means of manipulation for poetic engineering purposes. Chiara Mileto's constructor theory, or Cole Fury's use of octonians, as well as Clifford algebra or geometric algebra, may help find an underlying mathematical structure for supporting a new form of physics, which may allow like a new language or a new mixture for new realizations in the field, functioning akin to Negristani's toy philosophy for the sake of engineering purposes, restructuring the past at present to move forward into the future, allowing us to gain new knowledge or insight akin to a Gnostic form of gnosis or Hegel's form of history and absolute knowledge. Basically, in math, we have real numbers, which are one-dimensional numbers we all use. Then there are imaginary numbers represented by i, which is the square root of minus 1, and which we can plot on a 2D scale. Remember, Lacan refers to the phallus as the square root of minus 1 in his psychoanalytic triptych, as it refers to the imaginary realm. Then there are the quaternions, which need four sets of data, i, j, and k, as well as the real numbers, to plot in three dimensions where i squared is equal to k squared, which is equal to j squared, and where i times j times k is equal to negative 1. After that, we move up to eight dimensions with octonians. We use these numbers throughout all of physics, of course. The quaternions are also used in special relativity and electromagnetism. In the Fury, we can use octonions for things like the strong nuclear force. Complex numbers specifically are used in quantum physics all the time, but have been around for a lot longer than that even going back to Descartes, who wasn't much of a fan of them. For example, we could look to how Euler uses I in his mathematical identity, which, when we compare cosine and sine waves together with I, the imaginary number, and E, Euler's number, or the base of the natural logarithm, we can see how cosine, when pushed to infinity, accounts for the real numbers, whereas sine can be used when we factor out I to account for the complex numbers. If we replace the variable x with pi, we can show how e to the i times pi plus 1 is equal to 0. A good example of i being used in quantum physics would be the Schrodinger equation, where we start with psi equaling e to the i, but replace x with kx minus omega t, where psi is the wave function and where omega is the angular frequency with respect to time, and where k is 2 pi over lambda, or p, momentum over h-bar. And with two derivatives, and mostly just algebra and some mixing and matching, we can arrive at the time-independent and time-dependent Schrodinger equations. But I don't want to get lost in the physics, I just wanted to bring it up as an example of how we use I in math and physics. You know, plus, Schrodinger was a pretty cool guy. I mean, he smoked a pipe, he drank, he wore a bow tie, notorious with women, influenced by Hinduistic thought, along with like Oppenheimer, Bohr, and Sagan. So he was a pretty cool dude, came up with a crazy thought experiment involving a cat, you know, who would later become a Nazi cat boy, uh, to essentially criticize the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, which basically states that the, the, the quantum particle uh, does not exist in one state or another, uh, but it can exist actually in all possible states at the same time. Um, this, of course, led to Hugh Everett's claims of there being a multiverse, that's where that comes from, known as the many worlds interpretation. Um, his son also, Mark, ended up being a, a great musician as well, and there's a cool documentary about it called uh, Parallel, uh, Parallel Worlds, Parallel Lives in the link below, so even features a uh, Max uh, Tegmark cameo, so if you're interested, you can check that out, or if you're just interested in the band uh, Eels, you can check that out too. But anyways, despite how, of course, cool Schrodinger was, no one is as cool as the, uh, the great meth dealer of all time, uh, known simply as Heisenberg. Who created this thing called the uncertainty principle but um, nobody really cares about that you know people mostly just care about the massive amounts of uh, meth he was able to manufacture for himself anyways uh, tangentials aside all of this of course is linked to the theory of everything or the grand unified theory which attempts to unite as we said at the start of this video the quantum world with um, einsteinian's uh, world in terms of general relativity so the link between coming to know such absolute knowledge in a unified way through synthesis uh, between these opposites, of course, reminds us of Hegel from a philosophical perspective.
And it's been argued by some that Hegel's philosophy is rather hermetic, where, you know, as later noted in works like the, uh, the Cabalion, for example, all is mind or spirit. Uh, further noting how, you know, Hegel's dialectical triad is used for purposes of coincidentia oppositorum almost, as we brought up with Jakob Tabez, uh, in a Gnostic manner of approaching absolute knowledge through history, i.e., you know, where through self-consciousness all or God comes to know itself. So Hegel's philosophy isn't really a, a love of wisdom or Sophia in the Greek sense to thinkers like uh, Glenn McGee, but rather is an arrival upon wisdom or absolute knowledge itself. So there's a good podcast by the um, the Red Library podcast on uh, Glenn Alexander McGee's book, Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition. Um, there's also a, another good video by uh, Seekers of Unity questioning on whether Hegel or, was a mystic or, or not, so I'll put those in the link too. But again, the point of all of this is to show how mankind, whether philosophically, as in Negrostani's toy philosophy, or as seen in Hegel's philosophy leading to absolute knowledge, or in terms of the hermetic, alchemical, or Gnostic tradition, there is always the push to know and amalgamate opposites alchemically in order to advance onward as a species, reshaping us and the world around us into something new. We are always looking for a theory of everything, or a grand unified theory, the guts, as it were. However, in way of Godelian incompleteness, it seems as if the guts are getting hacked, mirroring land's implementation of the Deleuzian body without organs, thus destroying any sense of absolute knowledge, using Gödel, Cantor, and Dedekind cuts to keep the spiral from ever forming into a closed circle. We can push down the path trying to regain paradise or utopian perfection, as Giorgiani would like, on this path, but it seems we'll never be able to reach such a destination for ourselves. The circle, it seems, can never be closed or successfully understood. Unzicker annoys Witten in this way, and the outside remains unknown. But to quote Freeman Dyson, Gödel's theorem implies that pure mathematics is inexhaustible. No matter how many problems we solve, there will always be other problems that cannot be solved within the existing rules. Because of Gödel's theorem, physics is inexhaustible too. The law of physics are a finite set of rules and include the rules for doing mathematics, so that Gödel's theorem applies to them. And to quote Stephen Hawking, some people will be very disappointed if there is not an ultimate theory that can be formulated as a finite number of principles. I used to belong to that camp, but I have changed my mind. Paradises and utopias will always be out of reach, it seems. We can never fully know. And so anyone who promises you a paradise or an arrival point towards some kind of utopia should be treated with skepticism. Knowing God may just be outside of our imminent grasp.